and today Christ, the law, and the covenant. Let's pray. Our dear Father, as we open your word, we seek to understand the things that you have revealed. For you have promised that they are for us and our children. Fix them in our hearts that we may be settled into the truth so that we cannot be moved. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As a review, I've written a little paragraph that says, God gave Adam and Eve his Ten Commandment rule of conduct, guidelines of true love. To fail to obey them was sin, and they did just that. This placed humanity, that includes us, under the law's condemnation while it still demanded perfect obedience. Being, that's us, being now incapable of living up to God's standard, a simple system was instituted pointing to a remedy. That simple system, remember, was the sanctuary service and the whole ceremonial law. And it pointed to the remedy, which was the perfect life and atoning death of Jesus Christ. This rudimentary system met its end when in the fullness of time God sent forth his Son made under the law to redeem them who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Christ is the fulfillment of the law for everyone who believes in him. Covenant. What is a covenant? It's either a contract or a promise. Either or, huh? Contract, promise. Anyone else? What is a covenant or what does covenant mean? Oh, thank you, Maria. An Hold it up closer here. Mark. An agreement. An agreement. What is a covenant? Looks like Hugh's got a dictionary in his hand. He'll tell us. No. Do we have it all on the board? Contract, promise, agreement? What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. And then we want to ask, what value does a covenant have? So we have agreement. Agreement, we should have two parties, though. So two parties. Because, I don't know, you can maybe make a covenant with yourself, huh? But that would probably be between you and yourself. So that would still be two parties. An agreement between two parties. An agreement is a contract which involves promises, right? I promise to give you my house and property if you will give me $50,000. 
So there's a promise, a contract, an agreement if both parties sign. If you don't sign, we won't have a what? We won't have a covenant. But in my view, a promise doesn't have to associate with a contract. It can be alone. God gave promises without any uh, contract. Now, hang on. Keep the mic a moment now. Let me see if I understand you. You say a promise doesn't have to be a contract. What does a con well, tell me what a contract is then? Hold the mic up. A contract is an agreement. A contract is an agreement and a promise is not an agreement. Not it could be. A promise can be involved in an, in an agreement, but a contract, an agreement can be without a contract is all I'm saying. Okay. I think that Buck is hinting toward something that I use a different term for because the promise, I think, is the idea that, that we're talking about is unilateral in origin. God made a promise without Abraham helping him put it together because there are other covenants that are bilateral, right? So if I'm selling my house and you're agreeing to pay, I'm not just giving it away. I could promise, here's my house and I'm signing the deed. And you wouldn't have to do anything. That might be unilateral in origin. It was entirely my idea, and I'm just giving you my place. Or if we're signing a contract, is this the idea you're working on, Buck? A contract is going to be bilateral. We come together. Maybe we negotiate. I say I want 70000 and you say you only want to pay 40000 and we end up at 50000 and we have a bilateral agreement. So maybe all agreements or bilateral? You think so? Okay. Anyway, we have the idea of two parties so that we could say that covenants are bilateral in operation, but some are unilateral in origin. So, as far as I can tell, all covenants are bilateral in operation. If there's not two sides, it's not a covenant. But some covenants, we're suggesting, are unilateral in origin. God just comes along and says, I'm giving you this, or I give you my help. And others are bilateral in origin, and that's what we're going to try to remember as we consider covenants in the Bible. How many covenants has God made with humanity? Any idea how many covenants God has made with humanity? If any? Jackie, you want to comment? Abraham, uh, the flood, the, the uh, rainbow. That was a covenant that he's not going to flood the earth anymore. Um, Noah. Uh, How many of you got there? You've got 
Abraham or the Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant. Did you have another one? The rainbow that I mentioned. Oh, you want the them. you want the sign with the Noahic is the rainbow. What's the sign with the Abrahamic covenant? Did God give Abraham a sign in Genesis 17? What was it? Circumcision. 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 Any more covenants you can think of that God has made? We, otherwise, we could deal with covenants between people. But God has made some covenants with Noah, or you might say the Noahic covenant was made with the whole world, wasn't it? Sinai. Sinai, okay. I don't know how to put attic on the end of that. We'll put it in the attic. Sign attic, sign attic. Maybe like that. Any more covenants that the Bible talks about that God made with humanity? Pharaoh's thinking. You can think of another one. If you punch covenant on your computer in the Bible, it would have some adjectives in front of it like the... Don't want to add any more? Well, the Bible doesn't use this term except one place, I think, in Amos. The Adamic covenant, covenant made with Adam. We have Adam, Noah, Abraham, Sinai, Anything after Sinai? I think he made one in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah that I call post, post-exilic, after the exile, after the Babylonian captivity. One, two, three, four, five. Can we make seven? Covenant with David? I think so. Abraham, Sinai, post exilic, so David comes after Sinai, so we should have him in between there, shouldn't we? Davidic. Yes, that there will always be one of your descendants on the throne, right? Forever. Davidic. Then we'll go to the post exilic. Well, we've got six. Adamic, Noahic, Abrahamic, Sinai, post-exilic. We should I should have had Davidic in my list. And the new. Have you ever heard of the new covenant? or the everlasting covenant. It might be fair to add that, or it might be included in this. New, we'll put new and everlasting. So there, we've got seven. God's covenants with humanity. Why does Paul liken one of God's covenants to something evil? Maybe we should read the text. Let's look in Galatians. See if Paul really says that. Do you think he says that? That God 
made a covenant and Paul calls it evil? Doesn't sound quite right, does it? Galatians chapter 4. Tell me, verse 21, Galatians 4, 21 and onward, it says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. So we better come up somewhere with two covenants also, right? We've got seven. Maybe we need to do a reduction to two. So we'll come back to that. But Paul says in Galatians 4, 24, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not, Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bond woman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So Paul has two covenants, and he says one is a bondage, and one is freedom. Is he talking about two covenants God made? What are the two covenants? This is a class in covenant theology. That is the term especially used by our Calvinistic brethren. They are covenant theologians. They base their theology on covenants. And they are the best theologians in the world. So here's our class in covenant theology. We had seven on the board. Now we want it reduced to two. What are the two covenants that Paul talks about in Galatians 4? And are they both good? Is he comparing two good things in the verses we just read? Two good things? You think so, Maria? You don't think so. He's got two ladies. You can follow that much, right? One lady is named. We'll put it on the board. That's it. You'll remember the seven. Oh, I don't know. Maybe we should leave that. Let's see if we have room for two ladies over in this corner. Not supposed to put two ladies in the same kitchen, are you? But we're going to put them in the same corner here. So what's one lady's name? Hagar. Oh, well, we got him too. Well, I'm going to put it with an H, but uh, King James has it without the H. Hagar, and the other lady's name is Sarah. And what, is it, what else do we know about these two? It says, it says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do, you, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. Which of these two was a bondmaid? Hagar was a bondmaid. So who was the free one? What's he called? A free woman. Free woman. 
There is the free woman. So we have a bondmaid and a free woman, and it said they each had sons. Who was this lady's son? Ishmael. And what was the other lady's son? That's easy. They both start with I. Ishmael and Isaac, a bondmaid and a free woman, Hagar and Sarah. And it says, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the what? After the flesh. So this boy was after the flesh. He was born after the flesh. You remember the story, don't you? Abraham, could he still reproduce children? He could. Sarah said, you take Hagar, my maid. Could she reproduce children? She could. They had the ability in their own bodies to reproduce children, and they produced Ishmael, right? Born after the flesh. The other boy, what was he born after? But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by, verse 23, Galatians 4, but he that was of the free woman was born by promise. So we have flesh and promise. Ishmael and Isaac, bondmaid and free woman, Hagar and Sarah. And it says, which things are an allegory? That means this is to teach you something. This is for you. You can get something out of this story. This is an allegory for these are the two covenants. So these are the two covenants. So we're down here. We're getting two covenants in here. Maybe we'll give the covenants names. The one, and then they each have a mountain. Each woman has a mountain. What, what mountain does Hagar have? What mountain? What's that? Mount, uh, Mount Hagar had Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. She's by the law. What mountain does Sarah get? Well, we'll start it with an S also. You'd have to go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 to find out the name of Sarah's mountain, but she's got a mountain too. Hers is Zion, Mount Zion, or you can spell it with a Z, right? Because uh, Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 12, and he says, now, they came to Mount Sinai, but we're going to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And these two ladies, they each have a city, too. What's the name of Hagar's city? According to Galatians 4, it says, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, the generous to bondage, we know that's the bondage side, which is Hagar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. What city does Hagar get on her list? What city? Jerusalem. Thank you, Pharaoh. Jerusalem. And what city does Sarah get? For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. What city does Sarah get? Just a moment, I can't hear you. There's the microphone. The heavenly city. Yeah, what's its name? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So... Sarah gets a city also, and the name of her city is Jerusalem. Do you think there's any competition for names here? The one calls herself Jerusalem, and the other one, her name is Jerusalem. Oh, there's a little deception going on here, right? She's going to try to trick the whole world, right? 
You can say, I'm part of Jerusalem. Well, which one? Hagar is which Jerusalem? Jerusalem, we'll put an E for earthly, and we'll put a H after Sarah's Jerusalem for heavenly, right? So they each have a city, they each have a mountain, they each have a sun. One is born by the flesh and the other by promise. And so it goes on to say, but Jerusalem which is above is free. So this one, Hagar, it genders, that means it reproduces, it multiplies, it makes what? Bondage. Bondage. And... The Sarah one, what does it produce? Liberty or freedom, right? Freedom. Now, is Paul saying one of the covenants is good and one is not good? Is bondage good? No, you don't want to be slaves. So, we have Paul talking about, and which one does he say is not good? Which one does Paul say is not good of the two covenants? Hagar's or Sarah's? Speak up. Hagar's. Hagar's. And where was Hagar's given? Where was the covenant given? What mountain was it given on? They each have a mountain. Which is the bad mountain? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. What's the matter with Mount Sinai? You've got to be able to teach this this week to your neighbor. What was the matter with Mount Sinai's covenant? Two covenants. Paul has Hagar and Sarah. What was the matter with the Mount Sinai covenant? Paul doesn't talk good about it. Pharaoh. It was a fleshy covenant. It was what? Flesh. Covenant of the flesh. Why do you say that? Because they ate meat? <laughs> no. Because they, they, uh... well, I can't think of it right now. <laughs> because they said to God in Exodus 19, all that the Lord has said, we will do. We will do. Is that the flesh? Uh -huh. I'll produce a child, I'll get Hagar, and I'll produce a child. What was the matter with that covenant? It was flesh. It was flesh because flesh promised to keep it, and flesh, could they keep it? They were incapable. It says in, I think it's Deuteronomy 29, oh, that they had a heart in them to do the commandment. They didn't have it in them. We said in our introduction, we said... Being now incapable of living up to God's standard. When Adam brought condemnation on the whole race, he also brought corruption. And we're incapable of perfect obedience. But the law requires perfect obedience. It hasn't lowered its standard. So when the people came at Mount Sinai and said, Oh, thanks, Moses. That was a nice, uh, a nice thing you, you showed us there about what God wants, and we'll do that. How did they do within 40 days? They made the promise. A promise is part of the agreement, right? It's part of the contract. It's part of the covenant. It was a bilateral covenant in origin and in operation, right? So they said, we will do, and God says, I will bless if you do. And they said, we, we, we will. And how did they do? Pretty bad, right? Within 40 days, they were worshiping a golden calf and disobeying lots of the Ten Commandments. So, why does Paul call one of those covenants bad? God made the covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, and Paul calls it bad. Why does he call it bad? What's the matter with the Sinai Covenant? You have to have a microphone, sir. 
and your wife is bringing it to you. The covenant was breached by the Israelis. By the Israelis. Well, by, by God's people, right? It was breached. And why was it breached, Buck? They obviously uh, were not sincere in their agreement to follow the Ten Commandments. Not considering it? Well, they made a good promise. What does scripture say? It says, I think it's in Hebrews, isn't it? It'd be nice if we had time to read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, but it says, yeah, I think it's in, eight. Eight, Hebrews 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 1 starts by saying, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Let's see. Down there somewhere it should say they broke the covenant. Yes. Um, uh, down to verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon, what? Hebrews 6, 6, uh, 8, 6. A better covenant. Jesus is the minister of a better covenant that was established upon better what? Better promises. What kind of promises were those at Mount Sinai? They weren't very good ones, were they? Why not? because they didn't have a heart in them to do it. They were incapable of rendering perfect obedience, but they promised to do it. But it says Jesus is the minister of a better covenant, for if that first covenant had been faultless, oh, did God make a faulty covenant? Well, let's find out. Verse 8 of chapter 8 of Hebrews 4, Oh, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, so it was faulty, it was a faulty covenant, then should no place have been sought for the second. Verse 8. For finding fault with God's words. Is that what it says, Peggy? What does your version say? Finding fault with them. What was the matter? Were the words that God spoke on Mount Sinai faulty? No. Those were the words of the covenant. The Ten Commandments, it says in Exodus and Deuteronomy, are the words of the covenant. And Hebrews 8 says in verse 8, For finding fault with the words of the covenant? No. It was a perfect covenant. God gave a perfect Ten Commandment law. A perfect covenant covenant and he says but Paul says for finding fault with them what was the problem with the first covenant the people right on for finding fault with them he saith behold the days come saith the Lord when I will make a new covenant so we put that down here as number seven when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. Who didn't continue in the covenant? Did God keep his promises? God kept every one of his promises. He's faithful and he's true and he never fails. What he says he will do. But it says in verse 9, not according, I'm going to make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's Mount Sinai, right? That's Hagar's covenant. It says, not according to that covenant when I led them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, 
for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities, but I remember no more. And that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So which one of these two are we going to call old? The Hagar one or the Sarah one? Is the Hagar the old one or the Sarah the old one? This is the old one. So we're going to put O-L-D there. So what's the one that Sarah side? What are we going to call that one? I give, I give her a microphone. I can't hear Peggy. Can games, but it says he made the first one obsolete, not just Obsolete. Obsolete. Oh, well, we call it the Old Covenant, but we can, yes, that's the word there, obsolete. Obsolete. That means it's out of vogue, right? That means it's worthless. That means it's no good. You want to get eternal life? If you try this one, all that the Lord has said, I will do and be obedient, you're going to be in a bad shape. You're going to be in the Old Covenant. You're going to be obsolete. This one over here we're calling what? New, what's another name we can put for it? The new covenant is the, yes, everlasting, everlasting covenant. So actually, Hagar was before Sarah, so you might think of old that way, that Hagar goes for old and Sarah goes for new as far as which baby was born first, right? Ishmael was born first. But really, this one is old because it was ratified before this one. The old was ratified before the new. When was it ratified? Go to chapter 9 of Hebrews. Chapter 9, and they're ringing the bell on us. So we'll rush down to the end here. How many seconds do I have? No, they left. We're good. Okay. So, we have an old covenant and a new. How was the old covenant ratified? Do you want to give us a quick answer? Okay. So, Hebrews 9 tells us about the old covenant and how it was ratified. It says in verse 15, And for this cause, talking about Jesus, He is the mediator of the New Testament, it says in my version, New Covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, first testament, they which are called might receive the promise. So when was the new covenant ratified? This one over here, the Sarah, the free woman, Isaac, the covenant of promise that corresponds with Mount Zion and heavenly Jerusalem that brings freedom. When was it ratified? Speak up loud or... Oh, here's a microphone. At the cross. At the cross. What does it take to ratify a covenant? Blood. Do you know when you were a kid what you said? When you made a promise to your neighbor? And you said, cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a red hot needle in my eye. You can do all that if I don't keep my promise. You can kill me. You can stick a red hot needle in my eye if I don't keep my promise. That's the way we swore, right? We swore that our word was good. That's what it, shedding of blood is with a covenant. The shedding of blood and the promise for death. I just went to a wedding in Peru and they drank a little, a little cup of grape juice. What do you think that's all about? Blood. Why would you drink blood at a wedding? Because you're saying, cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a red hot needle in my eye. I will not go back on my promise to this beautiful young lady. And she says the same, I will stick with this man forever. So I got to attend. I was the godfather. So I got to tell him about stick a red hot needle in my eye for a couple minutes in the big reception there. Beautiful place. So here we are with covenants and Jesus spilled his blood to ratify this one. What kind of blood ratified the covenant at Sinai? Animal blood. They sacrificed animals 
And Moses took the bud and he sprinkled it on the book, the Ten Commandments, the law. There, if you don't keep this, your blood. And he sprinkled it on all the people. You guys are all willing to die and have a red hot needle in your eye if you don't keep what you promised. We are, we'll do it, they all said, right? And on all the articles in the sanctuary that were to teach them something different. They were supposed to learn from this service that there was a promised Messiah that was coming and that he would keep the covenant in their place for their redemption, for their eternal life. So in this covenant, it's by promise. Because God promised to Abraham unilaterally. He didn't say, Abraham, if you do this, that, and the other, then I will give you blessing and all your children blessing. God just said, I'm blessing you, Abraham, and all your children will be blessed. Are you a child of Abraham? If you are, then you're in the blessing. If you're a child of Hagar, one of Ishmael's children, you're outside of the promise, because that one's by the flesh. You better get busy and keep perfectly the Ten Commandments, or you're out for eternity. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we've considered a little bit about the covenant. We haven't had time to cover the signs, but we know that you have given signs with your covenants. And you've given witnesses. Help us in daily life as we make contracts, as we make marriage contracts and purchase of houses contracts and others to be reminded of the covenant that you entered into with your son who promised to be obedient and who fulfilled every promise he made in his perfect life and paid for all our sins in his bloody death. We thank you in his name. Amen.